Um, but like I said, I want to give you tools. So I want to express the things that are th how, how it works. There are aspects of neuroscience and behavioral economics and cognitive psychology that actually explain what's going on when we talk about empathy and gratitude. Uh, and then we're going to work it. I'm going to show examples how we're actually applying it uh, through examples here at Google in terms of certain strategies, uh, certain experiments, as well as some volunteer work that I do. And then, of course, Ryan's going to lead us through a workout. So E is for elef the elephant in the room. Um, we're all empathetic. All of us are empathetic, and we care. So why should you listen to me? I'm not saying you should. <laughs> Um, but I think all of us have felt this, that we are here because we care, that we are trying to offer something, that when we work in our relationships and our projects and our teams and our partners and product and ends, we're saying, see us, hear us, heed us. But this is a rational culture, and that can be a glorious thing. But Dan Ariely, who's a behavioral economist, actually explains to us that we're irrational because we're human. And because we're human and we're, rational, we're, we're a rational culture at Google, we're kind of cursed. So in behavior economics and cognitive psychology, there's actually a bias called the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge has when someone is so logical and educated that they don't really see the perspectives of those who are less educated than them and will question their version of reality. Um, and we've experienced some of that here. But more importantly, our big bias at Google is privilege. And I want you to hang on to that through this presentation. And, and it's not our fault. We're human beings. Turns out if you just have people playing Monopoly in, in, in experiments, whoever's winning starts to act arrogant. It's an evolutionary bio, biological hack, just like seeing cute puppies. And when we are in a privileged lifestyle, we start to become arrogant. And it's not our fault, but we can be mindful of it. And we can do something about that. So a lot of this that I'm going to share with you has already been started in amazing ways. And there are amazing people and amazing women leaders here. And Daniel Credick at Empathy Lab and Google X is doing a lot of this work. So please go check her stuff out. Um, so how did you get here? Well, I flipped a lot of burgers in county fairs. But beyond that, I was a biologist. And so marine biology, medical genetics. Um, and I wasn't a very good marine biologist because I kept on saving all the sea turtles hatching, throwing them into the ocean. Um, but through all of that was an understanding of what makes us tick. And I applied that for over a decade in advertising. And I needed to come back to a space that the canvas could affect people for betterment. Um, but that curiosity of what make, makes us tick was brought to photos. And I remember bringing in all these GIF animations from all the crappy photos that I made. Uh, of missed shots, missed opportunities. And uh, the product team were trying to figure out, hey, how do we get rid of all these photos that people you know, took by accident? And the logical solution was so hard, but the experiential solution turned out to be auto awesome. Um, and then I left Google. Um, I was entranced by the nonprofit and NGO sector. And it propelled me in an arena of social good, where we can work on bettering humanity. And I don't usually like photos of myself, but this one's meaningful. And the expression I have on my face is gratitude, but it comes at a time of great pain, because it was taken shortly after I took this photo. And this is my partner, the love of my life. And we were in the glacial fields of Western Iceland. to mourn. Um, and as she stood there, all these Viking horses surrounded her. And uh, they were the spirit of the person that we lost. Um, so vulnerability. Vulnerability hacks us again. 
and we look at emotions in our minds, these are all the hacks. And it turns out when you're vulnerable, we resonate with each other. We dig deeper and connect with one another. Um, Daniel Credit from Empathy Lab showed that even when an AI says, ah, I'm glitchy, that people who interact with the AI start to feel something. And they're more patient. So a number of these aspects of neuroscience uh, I've learned from Docker. Docker Keltner, who runs Greater Good and, uh, at Berkeley. And he also advised on this film, Inside Out. So these characters are actually based on pure science. And so this is Docker. Um, but we were trying to collaborate on how we could scale generosity when I was working at Social Good. And uh, he came over, and the pivotal research that he shared was that uh, meditation changes the brain. Um, and I was saying, we're at Google. We can do a lot, but I don't know if we can scale meditation. Um, and then the other pivotal research was small acts of kindness. Small acts of kindness and thoughtfulness and repetition changes your brain. And I said, we could do that. So this is the part where I want to talk about elephants and whales and a whole set of crazy things. And the reason I talk about it is something societal that I think we should uh, pay attention to. So there is a societal state of apathy. And Chamath, who's the former ex-Facebook uh, VP for growth, actually feels regretful because they had an intentional strategy of looking at dopamine feedback loops, and it works. Brain hacks work, but they're dangerous. And when you overstimulate dopamine and the feedback loop for dopamine, you actually damage the balance of neurotransmitters in our brain and our own ability to be empathetic because it creates a state of constant anticipation for the next thing. It heightens stress and it actually results in apathy. So technology has a responsibility of what we can do here. So who would win? Um, the answer is, it depends on which muscle you use. It turns out compassion behaves like a muscle. Compassion can be a muscle in the brain, and you just have to work it. Um, and in looking for that compassion muscle, at Stanford, they hooked up a number of uh, Tibetan monks and took a look, and the monks, they just laughed. <laughs> and the researchers were, yeah, because you look crazy. Uh, but the monks were like, <laughs> compassion's here, not here. <laughs> Turns out they were both right. Um, there's a system of vagus nerves between the brain, the heart, and actually the gut. There are neural cells around your heart and your brain. And these are highly interactive when you're expressing compassion. And there are, uh, our brains, they're an amazing thing. Um, so when we were talking about dopamine feedback loops and what happens when you weaponize them, it destroys this part of the brain. It wreaks havoc there. Now that's right between the front, our prefrontal cortex for higher cognition, and our amygdala and our hypothalamus for social awareness and connection and emotions. Damage this area, and you kind of become a sociopath. This area is also affected when you have dementia. This area is also the region of your compassion muscle. The ACC and the insula are your compassion muscles. They're nested right there in between your ability to think and rationalize and the ability to feel and recognize emotions in other people. That is what we need to pay attention to. What's really beautiful about that is when you look at even the neural structures, the neurons in that part of the brain are different from any other part of the brain. They're called spindle neurons, and they're four times larger than any other neurons. Not only that, they're only found in highly complex social species, elephants, whales, great apes, and us. This is your brain on gratitude. When you've been grateful for 15 minutes, 
This is what your brain looks like. It lights up in your compassion muscle. So there are other ways to do this. We talked about breathing, meditation, yoga. But turns out gratitude is a social contagion. We are highly social creatures. If you watch someone yawn, you might yawn. If you watch someone be grateful, this lights up. You don't even have to be grateful yourself. You just have to watch someone being grateful. You just have to listen to the stories of gratitude, and this lights up. So this could be our antidote to societal apathy, paying attention to what we're doing to this region of the brain. And the neurotransmitter soup that's there, we've heard about serotonin, we've heard about dopamine, but we don't hear enough about GABA. And G for gratitude. GABA is a neurotransmitter that helps regulate dopamine, that helps regulate cortisol, your stress hormones. And when we talk about great growth strategies, Dopamine is about anticipation, but gratitude lets you linger. It lets you be loyal. It lets you be appreciative and mindful and grateful. It lets you be compassionate. GABA, instead of looking at dopamine, how about we look at some GABA? And we did that. We gave it some coffee. Uh, what I mean by that is actually it digs into the work that we're doing. So I'm going to show several case studies of how we've actually applied that. So for example, um, I talked about privilege and entitlement and how that is not our fault. And in our culture, we tend to want to place blame versus accept responsibility and just be aware. And a lot of teachings around mindfulness is just that. Just be aware of it. You don't have to judge. Just be aware. And then what can you do about that? So we, we hacked together an experiment for the birth stations in, in New York. And what we did with that was we got a coffee cup, we attached some devices, let people badge in to say thank you to the baristas. Otherwise, you had to like pull out your laptop, you know, search for the mailing list. Maybe you know their name. In, in four days, we had 1,000 taps. In eight days, we had 25,000 taps. 500 Googlers, 1,000 Googlers participated organically. 500 of them came back for repeat visits. Some of them would say, I could do this all day. It was underneath the surface. They want to be grateful. And when we, were, we had this up, the entire line would light up. People would be peering over, smiling, laughing. They would have conversations. Not only do you tap, you get an email from the barista saying, thanks for saying thanks. And there's a small quiz about them. And all of a sudden, you get to know more about who they are. People come back and say, did that really happen? Engagement, community. And the reason we started all of this, because I have a lot of relationships with the baristas and the different Ruse uh, staffing. And, but they represent another segment of our community. Um, and the Seattle Weekly called it apartheid, that we have a segment of our community that works with us, that works alongside us. They feed us. They take care of us. They nurture us but we don't necessarily have them as equals. We don't really get to know them. We have privilege, they don't. And that creates distance. And gratitude bridges that distance. And it makes them visible. So we showed this. Uh, and the global director for Aruz said, we want this, we want this. And this is another reason why I'm excited that we're here, that we are embracing well-being. We are embracing the connections. And if we do that, maybe as we move forward, we'll have case studies where as we're having the case studies up there, we're listing the neurotransmitters that are important. Which neurotransmitters were important here? Oxytocin, when you're thinking about the people that matter to you, the people that helped you get here. It could be a different way of looking at the universe and our work here at Google. So there's a pilot project called Go Merci. Um, Erwin in the middle um, is the only person on it right now looking for volunteers. So if you want to experiment with some gratitude. Um, I volunteer a lot. And so I just came back from Singapore. And um, I advise on empathy and innovation for a few think tanks. 
and we work with groups associated with the UN. And for the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there was a hackathon. Um, it was in Singapore, and it was supposed to be 10 days of experiencing Singapore, and I thought I'd be at the hawker fair. And it was like, yes! And it turned out to be 18 hours a day for eight days in this room. Uh, <laughs> Um, and the logistics of the conference, I wasn't a fan. And yet I met all the people that were there. Uh, and the people that I had, we were tackling a subject uh, under well-being, mental health, which was really difficult. Um, and most teams, and most rooms had about two teams. We had five in our room. It was madness but you can never actually see that. Um, on the screens behind everyone, uh, I was looping a YouTube video of a beach and waves. And the reason I was doing that was with the intensity of audio in that room, the white noise actually helps block out surrounding conversations and lets people hear the conversations within their own group. So it was an environmental hack. But beyond that, Alpha brain waves are at 8 to 10 hertz. Alpha brain waves help you manage stress, lowers, your, lowers cortisol. It also promotes creative thinking. And in those 18 hours a day and eight days, we had incredible bonds and incredible creativity and calmness. We also did this. We would howl. And I have a lot of wolves in the presentation because there are stories of two wolves which in Native American lore, there is the wolf inside of you that's about family, community, nurturing, and love. And there's a wolf also that's about jealousy and anger. Which wolf wins? The one you feed. So I tell this story to my daughter, even though she's only two. Um, and then we howl together. And the reason wolves howl biologists have found, it's not because they're expressing aggression. They howl because they love. They're expressing love for their group and those that have recently left the group. And we would howl in the room. It became one of the best ways to interrupt all these great thinking minds because we'd be like, excuse me, we have to, excuse me, we're going to, uh, excuse me, that doesn't work. One of us just would start howling, and the rest of us would join in unison, and then we'd all stop, and then we'd all take a breath. I want you to experience this with me, OK? <laughs> On three, we're going to howl. OK, one, two, three. <gasps> we just expressed love in the animal world. But here's another body hack. You're nervous. People are working really hard on their ideas. When you howl, you breathe. Air into your diaphragms, oxygen to the brain, any residual tension, your muscles, and then they relax. It was also a behavioral hack to help people release tension once in a while and bond. So next time, shh, that doesn't work. Howl for them. Um, and they howled for us. I heard howling, and I came back into the room, and I was like, you howled without me. And they were like, hmm. And later on, it was their expression of gratitude to us. Um, and the creativity and the ingenuity led to, of hundreds of teams, this one team expressing mental well-being for the LGBT community globally and how that could work. And there were only four awards at the end. And one of our teams presented on a global stage on LGBT rights and how we could innovate on that. And you have to remember, Singapore, it's still legal there. And to stand on stage with that bravery and that boldness and to have security forces remove the Madam President before they presented because it was a no-win situation of her watching and not reacting. Yet ingenuity, calmness, and gratitude allowed them to take the stage. 
Um, the last one is evaluation and eval and big data. Uh, Tricia Wang has coined a term for qualitative data called, in qualitative research called thick data. And I love this. And she's, she's worked for Nokia. And um, we are a culture of big data. But it's this thick data of understanding what's going on with people at the ground level, their stories that adds context. And so um, Mac and I wanted to try this. So Mac are, and I are both here because we want to emancipate perspective. Mac has a number of themes, and some of them are around establishing better partnerships. He loves the word outsize. Outsize, hypothesize, have an opinion. We present perspectives and research, but do we really go out there and say, we need to listen to this? A strong hypothesis. And a huge brain hack culturally is reframing, reframing your stories so that people get them. So we did that and on job search. So they launched this last November. Congrats to the team. It was amazing. Um, but as we dug into the research, turns out for most American job seekers, their reality is very different from the calm world of like, we just want to let you put your resumes in. They're freaked out. They're scared. Um, and Dan Ariely speaks on this. It's demoralizing. Imagine putting yourself out there and being rejected over and over again. Your self-worth. And we took that and we dug deeper into the lit reviews and we came up and understood that we had this hypothesis, that these are some of the original slides from the deck that we actually share with the team. It's like, people aren't motivated properly, they procrastinate, it's discouraging work, employers are biased, and resumes don't get jobs. There's a concept of thinking wrong. Take a situation, flip it around 100 degrees, 180 degrees, sorry, 180 degrees, and the entire opposite might be something to consider. So point number two is procrastination. As a rational culture, we would say, let's give them better calendaring tools. Turns out procrastination is an executive lag functioning problem. You can't deal with it through scheduling. You actually have to deal with it neurologically and behaviorally. People are terrified. They shut down. So we continue with the hypothesis about possibilities. Um, we have great talent here amongst ourselves. We have ethnographers, we have behavioral economists, neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, yet we don't get a chance to flex our muscles. So on our team, Hillary and Dono were the first to help me and advise me on things like ethnography and things like the concept of chance. And Saul, Saul helped me right before we dived into the questionnaire to start this research around uh, American job seekers. And he said, ask the catastrophic question. The catastrophic question? Yeah, when everything fails. And similar to good journalistic thinking, that's what happens. You ask the catastrophic question, and you get the profound perspectives of what happens when things go wrong. And videos are important. We're a rational culture. And when we see data, we refute the data. And the engineers and the product managers I've worked with are some of the most empathetic people. But they need to see it themselves. Because once you see it, you can't unwitness it. I've had engineers and product managers come to me and say, you know, my friend, my sister, my mother, my neighbor. When it's people they see, they care. And so through this diary study, we just focused on daily entries. And what we got back was highly intimate because people have their own phones, and they're speaking to it from their bedrooms or their private areas. And they would tell us, these are things I wouldn't have told my husband or my mother or my partner. But as we looked at each video, the theme was, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm sad, I'm okay, I'm sad, I'm worried, I'm sad. And we called it we call the screener confessions of a job seeker. And just that word, confessions, the untapped anxiety that people had. In four days, we had over 400 people requesting to be part of the study. We narrowed it down to 40 who were very expressive based on 
their environment. And so you have Matt Campbell and Irene Rose, who are lead engineers on Employ, and they're sitting watching these videos, and they're holding their heads in their hands. They see, they feel, beyond the logs, they finally get to see. So this was a three-week dire study with D-Scout. And it was incredible, just the level of intimacy. And where we got to was even asking questions. So we, we tailored the screener to talk about, in a way, and get to your emotional well-being. So who did you rely on most when you're in times of stress? Most people said themselves, or their partners. But most people said themselves. Um, and what's crazy is at the start, everyone says, yeah, my job seeking pros uh, prospects are pretty good. I feel pretty good. I'm pretty happy. And in almost every survey we've done, even in the past at Google, that's what people say. They're lying to themselves and to us because as we followed them day after day, their behaviors and what they actually showed was that they were scared, they were sad, they were unhappy, they were anxious. And their behaviors reveal the truth. We've all seen this. And the research team looked to map it and, sure, search, you know, apply, interview. It should be like this. And a couple times you're going back. The reality is it's actually like this. This is their darkness. And this is exactly what the PM drew back to us. When we showed that this possibility happens, the PM embraced it. Like, they even go through a bit of a death spiral. There was a huge am ambiguity in logs of, like, what's happening? We're, like, people who are looking for jobs should be looking for more work right here after they apply. Turns out, after people apply, they're so frozen with anxiety that they don't even want to start the process again. So we hinted a solution to what was a huge mystery in logs to understand the emotional behavior. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. And a lot of it was because they just didn't know how to map their expectations to the world. They didn't have the privilege we have when we have recruiters. They don't have the privilege we have when we have peers who go before us and tell us what to expect. So matching expectations, but we were always focused on people, always focused on people. And it's also important to embed your own mole in there. So this was an agency called Method. But Peter Gray, who is a researcher on our team, was also part of that team. He embed himself. And he was our super sleuth in terms of well-being. Um, and one of the statistical significant findings he had was something about emotional positivity, or what I call resilience. Because when you are accepting and thoughtful and reflective, you have more GABA. When you're hopeful, it's about anticipation. It's dopamine. And there was a chart. And when we mapped this one area about looking at professional ties and relationships and whether we refer to them for emotional support or advice, it was empty. For suburban and rural Americans, it's empty. That, for us, is full. And the research shows when you use weak ties and strong ties, you better your chances at getting a job. You better your chances at being mentored and getting a grasp of the world. So that's our opportunity. Um, Kelly McGonigal talks about it as willpower and similar to emotional resilience. When we talk about meditation, mindfulness, all of these things, they're affecting our brain neurotransmitters. And it changes us. It makes us more capable. And so we take stories like this. that can become more meaningful for our partners and product. So Joy, who's the product manager, said, I, I never really understood it like this before. You've revealed so much. She could now draw that flow. She could draw the messy chart. She could draw that grid and where it was empty. Um, and the types of interactions when you're job seeking for this group is like being in a really bad dating situation where you're rejected all the time. It's like someone telling you you're awesome but then ignoring you. It's sociopathic, and they're lacking options. It's like being an abuse victim. So it's hard for privileged individuals to understand underprivileged job seekers, but we can understand bad dating, and we can understand bad relationships, and we can understand being abused. That reframing helped the team approach it entirely differently. 
And so how did it all start? We just imagined the possibilities. And so Nick Zakresk, who leads Social Impact, actually said, I have this crazy dream. And he sent me an email saying, imagine if person X could get this opportunity and it could provide a bunch of things. And I turned it into a poster and sent it back to him. Validating our relationships and intuition in each other on the teams also helps propel things forward. But it's important because in jobs, we need to recognize a representation of ourselves. And because when we realize something, when we visualize something, we actualize it, we make it happen. And so your ability to be a welder or be an IT support, how, how can that happen? So I want to wrap up by just talking about pain and suffering. Um, quite often we think pain and suffering is the same deal. Um, but it turns out suffering is a choice. And that's where reflection and mindfulness does. We can be aware of the pain, but we can choose whether we want to suffer. And the reason I share that is because I don't know how many of you change stinky diapers, but stinky poopy diapers. <laughs> You suffer. And like, <laughs> oh, I have to change these diapers. Oh, I have to pay these bills. Oh. A good friend of mine, Paul Moody, said, I get to. I get to change these diapers on this great joy in my life. I get to pay the bills on the house that houses the loves of my life. I get to do these amazing things because I'm here now. And that helped me get to this epiphany because I used to get depressed a lot working on work for social good and assisting in crisis response, Travis. Um, seeing the ills that we do and the evil that we do to each other, I just couldn't take it. And uh, I get an email from NASA every morning and this is the part that helps me. Um, they show me something like this. This is the Andromeda galaxy. I don't know if you know this, but it's on a collision course with our galaxy, so we're all going to die. So you're going to die. You're going to die. Back there, you're going to die. We're all going to die. We're going to die. <laughs> so why do anything at all? Um, so when we look at the Milky Way and we zoom out, through the clouds, even in the darkest part of the sky, are billions of galaxies. And you zoom out even more, and this is what's called a supercluster. This is Lana Ikea, immeasurable heaven in Polynesian. It's a supercluster of galaxies. You zoom out even more, and all the superclusters of galaxies look like this. You zoom out even more, and it's just that, the immensity of it all. And we're this tiny little thing on this pebble and we fight for everything, why? But as a biologist, when I first saw this, it touched me deeply, because what I saw was the connective tissue in our bodies. At the edges of the known universe, it looks just like us. We're connected. There's a reason, and there's a science to it. And there are stories with it. And we can be true to one another and listen to one another and be grateful. Mm -hmm.